Welcome everyone to the Q&A session for our upcoming course, Ayurveda for Strengthening Your Immune System and Balancing Mind, Body, and Soul. I'm Lisa Panis, and I'm really looking forward to hosting this Q&A conversation for the SHIFT Network, where we'll explore the teachings of Dr. Mark Halpern and address questions about his upcoming seven-week course, Ayurveda for Strengthening Your Immune System and Balancing Mind, Body, and Soul, which begins Monday, April 20th. And a little later, I'll explain how you can participate in the course, even if you can't attend the live sessions. But first, I want to introduce our guest. Dr. Mark Halpern is the founder and president of the California College of Ayurveda, the oldest school of Ayurvedic medicine in the United States, co-founder of the National Association of Ayurvedic Schools and Colleges, the National Ayurvedic Medical Association, the National Council on Ayurvedic Education, and the California Association of Ayurvedic Medicine, He's played an important role in building the infrastructure of Ayurveda in the United States. Dr. Halpern has received numerous awards for his service to Ayurveda in both India and the U.S., and is one of the few Westerners who's been recognized as an expert in the field of Ayurveda in India. And in just a few minutes, we're going to open up for your questions. But first, I want to welcome Mark, who's going to begin our time together by leading us in an opening meditation. Welcome, Mark. It's so great to see you today. Thank you, Lisa. It's such an honor to be here with you and with the Shift Network audience. I'm so very much looking forward to spending time with the students and exploring this important subject of OGIS and Ayurvedic medicine and really building your immunity. But what I'd like to do right now is just begin today's program with a short meditation. So wherever you are, wherever you might be watching this program, just take a moment with me, if you will, and go ahead and Close your eyes, keep your spine straight and your head forward. And let's just go ahead and center ourselves. We'll allow ourselves to quiet down for a moment, wherever you are. Feel yourself sitting, become aware of your breath. Just allow yourself to be the witness of your breath. Be the witness of your body. And even those thoughts that are moving through your mind right now, be the witness of those thoughts. We are not our bodies because we can witness our bodies. We are not our thoughts because we can witness our thoughts. Not this body not this mind. Consciousness and joy incarnate, bliss of the blissful am I. As we continue our meditation, I'm going to chant the mantra. This is a mantra for illuminating the mind. Ayurveda comes from India. It's a tradition to start a program with a mantra. This is called the Gayatri Mantra, the mantra of light and illumination. It's the mantra of the sun. Om Bhuva Swaha Tat Savit Hovarenyam 
Bargo Devasya Di Mahi Dio Yonha Pracho Dayat Om Bhuva Swaha Tat Savito Varenyam Pargo Devasya Di Mahi Dio Yonha Pracho Dayat Om Bhuva Swaha Tatsavito Varenyam Pargo Devasya Di Mahi Dio Yonha Pracho Dayat Om Shanti 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 Namaste and welcome to today's program. I'm so honored to be with you all. I'm looking forward to spending time with each of you as we explore Ayurvedic medicine and explore the, the, the topic of ojas and the topic of immunity. This is such a volatile time in our society. And I know that everybody is wanting to improve their immune system because we're all a little bit afraid right now. And it's my great hope that when we come together on Monday nights, that we'll come together in a safe and a sacred space where we can share with each other, where I can answer your questions and share the knowledge of Ayurvedic medicine with you. And we're together we can work to build our immunity and build our well-being. I look forward to it. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mark. Um, well, we have the rest of our time together to dive into our viewers' questions for Mark as we prepare for his upcoming course. Again, it's called Ayurveda for Strengthening Your Immune System, and it begins Monday, April 20th. And if you want to check out the website and learn more about the seven-week course, you can visit ayurvedaforhealthcourse.com to see the full description. So let's go ahead and dive into some Q&A. If you have a question for Mark, go ahead and type it in. I'll be happy to pass them on and read them aloud. In the meantime, we've got quite a few questions already lined up. People are interested in this topic. And uh, as you've already mentioned, Mark, a lot of people are wondering about this whole coronavirus thing. So let's start out with uh, the most frequently asked question, I'll read Diane's version of it. What's the one thing that folks can do now to strengthen their immune system with Ayurveda? You know, when asked what is the one thing that people can do, I'm always at a loss because there are many things that we can do that will all help to build our immune system. So I'm sure during the course of, of this hour, we'll get into a lot more of those things that build your immune system. But if I was to say one thing right now that just comes to my mind, the first thing that comes to my mind, that's to not worry too much, not to overly get anxious. You know, we use our worry, we use our anxiety to take necessary action. When we are confronted with a threat, it's natural to go into fear and anxiety and worry. It's not only natural, for many people, it's very useful. It's useful because it can motivate us to act. It can motivate us to wear a mask. It can motivate us to use hand sanitizer or to wash our hands. It can motivate us to change our habits and to, to become uh, more balanced as, as people living in this world. While it serves a very useful purpose, it also can challenge us because those feelings and those thoughts that are inside of our mind affect the functioning of our cells. We have receptors on each cell in our body that are able to receive messages from the mind. So all those neurochemicals are affecting cellular function. When we produce the neurochemicals of fear, that is going to 
down-regulate our immune system and make it more difficult for us to fight infections. So when we are in a state of fear and worry and anxiety, we're actually more likely to get sick. So the question then becomes, what can we do if fear motivates us, then what can we do to motivate ourselves when we're not in fear? Well, the first thing we have to understand is, is that you can take action without being in fear. You have that choice all the time. Now, sadly, we don't always make that choice. We don't always make the choice to live in a harmonious manner unless we're under pressure. So some of us put ourselves under a tremendous amount of pressure because we think that's the only way that we'll take the action that's gonna lead us to being safer. So I believe that we can take that action out of self-love. That if we love ourselves, then we will take the actions that are necessary to protect ourselves. We don't have to be in fear. We don't have to be in anger, right? We can actually take those same actions from a place of love, that when we love ourselves, we will also protect ourselves. And I believe that when we come together in community, as we will on Monday nights, when we come together in community, we will, we will through the power of the group, we will inspire ourselves to take those actions that are going to bring about health and well-being. So we'll, of course, explore all those actions, and there may be more questions about them today. But my point to answering that question really is that we can relax a little bit. And I don't mean relax in terms of not doing the things that are necessary to be well. I just mean that we can relax on the inside, that we, we can tell ourselves, we, we, we got this, we're gonna be okay, we are safe, we are going to be well, and we will take those actions. And by calming down on the inside, we will do a tremendous amount to support our immune system. So from that place of inner quiet and inner calm, we can use the knowledge that we'll gain to take the necessary actions. I hope that helps. Yeah, it really did. Thank you, that was an excellent response. Thank you. Um, in fact, this perfectly leads into the next question here. Uh, this is from Ramani, who uh, is asking specifically about the big picture of the course. How are mind, body, and spirit integrated together to build a strong immune system? Does it need to go step by step, first body and mind, and finally spirit? The spirit, uh, he's wondering about the hierarchy. Yeah, it's a great question, Ramani. Um, you know, from an Ayurvedic perspective, body, mind, and spirit, which we can also use the word consciousness for spirit, body, mind, and consciousness are all integrated. We don't really separate them. In other words, we don't really treat the body separate from the mind and consciousness. We don't treat the mind separate from the body and consciousness, and we don't treat consciousness separate from body and mind. We're used to, here in the West, dividing everything up. We have doctors of the body, then we have doctors of the mind, and then our clergy are the doctors of spirit, and we have different people to address different parts of ourselves. In Ayurvedic medicine, we find that it's an illusion to try to separate them, that they're so integrated, one immediately affects the other. I'm not saying that they're the same, I'm saying that they are, are part and parcel of one another in this incarnation. So the answer to your question is, we work on body, mind, and consciousness all at one time, or body, mind, and spirit all at one time. An example of that is, let's say we're working with an herb. We understand that there are chemicals in that herb that are going to affect the physiology of our bodies. We also understand though that every herb has certain qualities in it. The word we use in Ayurveda is called gunas. And these gunas are going to affect the physiology of the body, but also the physiology of the mind and the physiology of consciousness itself. And when I talk about consciousness or spirit, what I really mean by addressing that is that we want to be able to achieve a state ultimately, this is our ideal, where the, the bridge between mind and consciousness is absolutely clear. We use the word sattva for clarity. And from that place of clarity, 
we're able to receive the guidance from our highest self, we could say from the divine, that knowledge will move from above down into our hearts and then the inside out. So it moves from consciousness or spirit into our, our heart, which then affects our mind. And the mind then affects the body. So they're immediately all in, this, this all happens within nanoseconds. So body, mind, and consciousness are always affecting one another. And that's true of every food that we eat. It's true of every herb that we take. It's true of every action that we take in this world. If I listen to music, it's going to affect my body and my physiology. It's going to affect my mind and it's going to affect the level of my clarity that leads to my connection to spirit. So therefore, we want to choose our music very carefully. We want to choose our foods very carefully. We want to choose the herbs that we use very carefully. In fact, we could say that Ayurveda very much is about living a life of awareness, where we're simply engaged in that awareness and we can take action from that place. Hmm. I hope that helps. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, Let's take this uh, in, in a different direction. We've got two similar questions, so let me read them both. One is, what's the connection between yoga and Ayurveda? And then the follow-up question is, uh, you mentioned that yoga and Ayurveda are two sides of the same coin. This is in your conversation with Stephen. Uh, the question continues, I find what you've talked about to be fascinating, but I just can't get into yoga no matter how I try. Does this mean that Ayurveda won't work for me? Mm, great question. Well, you know, it, it really depends on what it is about yoga that is, is disturbing you. And let's talk a little bit more about yoga. When most people think of yoga, they tend to think of, of exercises. And sometimes yoga exercises do not work for people. The proper word for that is asana. So sometimes the yogic exercises they don't work for a variety of reasons. Maybe somebody is physically unable to do those yoga poses. Uh, it could be that maybe somebody's used to a different form of exercise and that form of exercise seems to work better as a exercise regimen for them. Or maybe it's the culture of yoga that bothers that person and the culture of yoga just doesn't really work for them. They don't want to sit in a room and listen to people chant or, or whatever experience they might be having. What is it, the question is, what is it that, that is, is bothering you about yoga? Now, it's important to understand that yoga is about much more than the exercises. So people think of yoga and they think of exercise, they think of the yoga class, but yoga is so much more than that. Yoga is actually a body of philosophy. And the yoga poses are, exist only for the purposes of helping a person to become comfortable in their bodies so that their mind can be at peace. All of yoga exists so that the mind can be at peace. That's an essential point. If you go into the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which is the classical text on, uh, on yoga, the second sutra, Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodha means that yoga is achieved when we eradicate the disturbances of the mind. Now, what do they mean by yoga being achieved? The word yoga means to unite or to connect. What are we trying to unite with and connect with? Well, we're trying to unite and connect with that which is greater than ourselves. Spiritual people of different faiths or religions might give that a name. They might call that God by one name or another, trying to connect with God. Other individuals might say, I'm trying to connect with the universe, or I'm trying to connect with all of creation, or I'm trying to connect with the greater consciousness. There are many ways to say this in different traditions. But what we're trying to connect with is that which is greater than ourselves. And that's yoga. So yoga is achieved, that connection is achieved when we eradicate the disturbances of our mind. The disturbances of our mind are the obstacles that are in the way of making that connection. Now, when we make that connection, we feel blissful. We feel loving and kind. Our hearts are open. We feel nothing but pure joy. 
The disturbances of the mind are the obstacles to experiencing love, the obstacles to experiencing joy. We all know about those disturbances in our mind because, well, we, we all have them to some one degree or another at different times. Fear is a disturbance of the mind. Anger is a disturbance of the mind. Grief is a disturbance of the mind. Depression is a disturbance of the mind. In fact, thinking about the future is a disturbance of the mind, and thinking about the past is a disturbance of the mind. It's only right here, right now, that we can experience the stillness that is inherent in the mind. Now, it's very difficult to train the mind to be still. This is why we meditate in yoga. That's right. Yoga is not just about exercise. It's also about meditation. It's about philosophy, like I'm talking about right now. Yoga is a body of knowledge that we could say is the spiritual side of Ayurveda. And Ayurveda is the practical side of yoga. We could also say that Ayurveda is the healing side of yoga. So Ayurveda exists so that we can do the work in our lives that is, we could say, our spiritual work. Our spiritual work that we do is going to be the service that we provide to our society, but it's also moving forward in our own journey toward becoming more loving, more kind, and more connected to the universe or to God. So yoga is achieved by eradicating the disturbances of the mind. Everything in Ayurveda and in yoga is for the purposes of creating a calm body and a calm mind. So Ayurveda provides the tools for living in the world and how to live in the world in a way that's going to facilitate that kind of calm and balance. And yoga expands upon those tools so that we're able to uh, do the inner work that is necessary to create that broader connection to the divine. So they are part and parcel of each other, or we could say two sides of a coin that can't be separated. Okay, thank you for, for going into that. Um, so now let's let's take it in another direction again. Uh, let's talk about uh, the role of food. We've got a question here. What is the role of food in building a strong immune system? Well, you know, food is so important on so many levels. If we look at it from a Western perspective, physiologically, we could say that your immune system is going to need the proper vitamins, the proper minerals, the proper amount of carbohydrates and fats and proteins in order to receive the nutrients that it needs in order to do its job. So we could certainly say that food is essential to that. If we use the Ayurvedic understanding of food, we can be a lot more precise, actually. Ayurveda teaches that nothing is right for everyone and everything is right for someone. What kinds of foods do you need that are going to provide the proper nutrients for your immune system? What's interesting is that that is different for each person. Now, we're used to hearing about a diet that is, it's one size fits all. Everybody should do this or everybody should do that. If you read a self-help book about diet, it's going to say, you know, follow this diet because it's going to help you to be a healthier person. Ayurveda says there is not one diet that is right for everyone. In fact, you have to begin by understanding yourself. Who are you and what are your unique individual needs. And we base that on what Ayurveda calls your constitution, or the Ayurvedic term for that is your prakriti, which is determined at the moment of conception. The closest thing to that from a Western perspective would be to say it's based on your genetics, that we all understand that we have unique genetics, we have unique predispositions. One person could have a predisposition to a particular type of cancer, another person could have a predisposition to heart disease and somebody else to becoming overweight or obese. So we have these genetic tendencies that Ayurveda calls your constitution, and we understand that. 
And based upon that, it's going to determine how you're going to utilize the nutrients in your body and what foods are going to provide those nutrients. So our goal in Ayurveda is to prescribe a unique program for each person that matches that person's needs. Now, not only do you have a certain tendency that you came into this world with, but then there's what you've done with that tendency. How have you lived your life? How much stress are you under? What is your life like today? We also seek to understand that in Ayurveda, and the word for that is your vikruti, and that's your current state of balance that you're in. And of course, we utilize the words doshas in order to understand the energies of the body that define whether you're in balance or out of balance. Based upon what's happening with you right now, we will alter your program. You may need different foods in order to restore your inherent balance that was present at the moment of conception. So the short answer to your question is food is essential to providing you with the nutrients that you need, but we all need different nutrients. And Ayurveda is a path of understanding what foods are going to be right for you. And I'm not going to tell you that you should do the same thing that I do, but we're going to work together to find out who you are and what you need. And that's going to be an important topic in our course. We're going to dedicate one whole class to the subject of diet and nutrition and cooking and mixing foods together and spices together so that the foods are prepared in a way that you will digest them well. You see, even if you take the proper foods, but you don't digest them well, you won't be able to extract the proper nutrients from those foods. So digestion is essential, just as essential as the foods that you take in. And so we'll explore that. And we'll also spend a lot of time in the course, a whole module figuring out who you are, as well as your current state of balance, so that you can make all the proper decisions in your life that will lead you to be much healthier. Okay, boy, did you just open up a can of worms? The questions are pouring in. <laughs> but for those of you who are just joining us, we're here with Dr. Mark Halpern learning about his upcoming course, Ayurveda for Strengthening Your Immune System and Balancing Mind, Body, and Soul, which begins Monday, April 20th. And you can log on to ayurvedaforhealthcourse.com for all the details and to register. So let's dive into that can of worms here. We've got a question here from Amy who wants to know, now, if everyone's path to health is different, how can you best support the ojas of your family of varying doshas if you're the person who does most of the shopping and cooking? Thank you for that question, Amy. It, it's really a very important question. The good news is that if you're the person who does the shopping and the cooking, then it's a lot easier because you can control what is happening for everybody in the family. But of course, you have to have their agreement that they want to be well and that they are all in this together. So it begins really with, under, with the, everybody in the family understanding who they are and what the balance of energy is within each of them. And an Ayurvedic practitioner can help you with that. Ayurvedic books can help you with that. Ayurvedic classes like uh, we're gonna have are gonna be able to help you with that. And so you wanna understand each person's unique needs, but then you have to cook for everybody. I'm assuming that uh, you're, you're, you're the mom and you want to know, how do I cook for one person who has one constitution? Maybe they're more vata dosha. Somebody else has a different constitution. Maybe they're more pitta dosha. And maybe there's a third person with an imbalance that has a kappa imbalance. And so you want to work with all of them. What do you do about a situation like that? Well, the first thing that I want to say is that, that ultimately, each person is responsible for their own health and their well-being. So our health and our well-being is about more than just about food, but each person has to begin by making that choice to participate in their own health and well-being. Now, we start getting into a lot of details here that are difficult in a Q&A session like this, but that we will get into during the, uh, the course. Let me just give you an example 
of this tell you that it can be challenging, but that there are also solutions, okay? Let's say one person has what we would call in Ayurveda a kappa imbalance. And let's just say for, for this purpose right here, that what I'm talking about is, is that person is, is uh, overweight. And somebody else has a vata imbalance. And that person is underweight. And you need to make a meal, because I, 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 I doubt you want to make a meal for five different people, make five different meals in the house. Now, sometimes that works and you might want to do that, but sometimes that doesn't work. So what we have you do, what I recommend you do, is you make a meal and you have to understand all of the, the energetics of the various foods and ingredients that we're going to get to when we teach that part of the course. But you want to make a food that is going to be accessible to each person, but then they may change the qualities of that food in two ways. One is through spicing. Each person can use a different set of spices on that food. And that will help each person be able to digest the food in a way that matches their physiology. So that's important, right? We can all spice our food differently. So you can have spice mixtures for vata, for pitta, for kappa, that they can add to their different dishes. Now, the second thing is each person can consume that food in a different quantity. So the person who is overweight may need to consume that same food, but in a smaller quantity. We say in Ayurveda that even something that is heavy becomes light when it is consumed in small quantities. And even something that is light becomes heavy when it is consumed in large quantities. So we can adjust for each person the quantity of the food, the spices that are added to the food, and then the ingredients themselves can be prepared, the basic ingredients can be prepared in a more neutral manner. Now that's an example for two people, but you can use that example to understand how you might prepare food for five different people or 10 different people or even a party of 100 people that you're holding, that you're hosting, is that you can still make basic foods that are accessible and healthy for everybody, but yet these are ways that people can personalize the foods that they're going to take. Now, I wanna emphasize that if somebody is very sick, if somebody is very sick, then that person really should have food prepared for them as an individual. So that's really the art of Ayurvedic nursing in a way. If you were in an Ayurvedic hospital, all right, and you had a particular condition, food would be prepared for you that is going to help you. Now, many of the Ayurvedic hospitals, and there are many hospitals in India, but much of this happens for people at home, traditionally in India and now here in the United States. When somebody really is sick and there's one person that's sick, their needs are going to become more important than the rest of the family. We have to get them well so they can come back and join the whole family. And so, then we will prepare everything precisely to help that person to heal. So if somebody had cancer or heart disease or an autoimmune disorder or some more serious condition, well, then we wanna prepare the food for that person as much as possible. And if you're working with an Ayurvedic doctor or a clinical Ayurvedic specialist or an Ayurvedic health counselor, because there are different titles that different practitioners will use based upon the level of their education, but in all of these situations, they can guide you and your family through that process that will meet the most specific needs of everybody in the community. I hope that answers your question. It was a great question. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for uh, for diving in with that. That was uh, that was a lot of good information. And you mentioned. Uh, people being overweight. And we've got people asking about that as well. Let me read Shannon's version of it. She says, many of my friends and I are gaining weight and getting out of shape during this time because we have to shelter at home and can't get the kind of exercise we're used to. And the grocery stores are picked over. So we have limited food choices. What do you recommend to best maintain a healthy weight under these conditions? Mm. You know, thank you. That's a, that, that's a very good question. Uh, maintaining our weight 
is a challenge under any condition in our society. We have an extraordinary challenge in our society with individuals being uh, overweight and obese. And so the, the key really to managing weight is understanding what your body needs and then being able to give your body what it needs and no more. This is a challenge. I don't mean to make light of this at all. So for instance, I'm, I said before, if a food is heavy, but you eat a small amount of it, it becomes light. So let's just use a heavy example of a food like yogurt. Yogurt is a heavy food. Uh, we could say ice cream is an even heavier food. Uh, pudding is a heavier food. And so these foods are obviously uh, high calorie foods. They're, they may be high in sugar, they may be high in fat, and there's a lot of people who uh, try different diets that reduce sugar. Some people try diets that reduce fat. Really what it comes down to is, is ultimately, ultimately it's reducing the heaviness of the food. We also reduce the heaviness of the food when we eat less of it. So in other words, if I only have one bite of ice cream, I'm not going to gain weight, but if I have you know, a pint of ice cream, uh, I will. So the question then becomes, what does my body need? What is going to satisfy my body? Now I'm assuming here for a moment that you can't get the ideal foods, right? Because they're off the shelf. So therefore you're eating foods that are not ideal for you. Maybe you're eating more, a, a diet of more pretzels and occasional ice cream and bread and cheese and yogurt. And these are all things that are heavy. So these foods that are heavy will actually fill you up faster than the foods that are light. The foods that are light, let's just use as an example, a salad. A salad is light. So you have to eat more of it in order to get full. It takes longer to eat it. If you eat enough salad though, believe it or not, you can gain weight, especially if you put too much of dressing on it. You also gain a lot of weight because that's just oil, that's fat again. But too much of anything, too much of something that's light becomes heavy. And if you take less of something heavy, it becomes light. So what does this mean? What this means is you pay attention. You have to start learning to eat until you are 75% full. That's our goal in Ayurveda, to fill our stomachs three quarters of the way full with no matter what we eat. And so a lot of times what we'll do is we'll have people keep a food journal where you monitor yourself and you say, after I have a meal, how, how full do I feel? Do I feel 50% full? I'm really hungry if I do. 75% full? I'm satisfied, but I could certainly eat more, especially if I like the food. Am I 100% full? Oh, boy, yeah, I, I ate a lot there. I'm 100% full. Maybe I'm 110% full and I'm feeling tired afterward and I feel a little heavy and, and I, I, I definitely overate, but boy, that really felt good. And maybe after Thanksgiving, I feel 150% full. Starting to pay attention to how full we feel is really the key. And then our goal is to stop at 75%. And that takes more practice and more discipline and more support in order to do that. And so during the course, you'll have some support in order to make some changes in your life that you feel like you want to make. So learning to eat till we're 75% full is really the key no matter what you eat. If you're eating ice cream and yogurt and bananas and dates and heavy things, it'll take less to feel 75% full. If you're eating lettuce and tofu, it's going to take more to feel like you're 75% full. But that's the key right there, paying attention to how we feel at the end of a meal and then getting used to that, getting used to that awareness, that mindfulness, and then being able to stop at 75%. And that's another story is how do we actually control ourselves when we really like our foods? And that's maybe another question for another day. But eating till we're 75% full is the key to managing your weight no matter what you eat. Well, that's a
fascinating perspective. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm looking at the clock here. Uh, we have time for a few more questions, but before we take those, uh, I'm going to go ahead and give a few details about the course itself. Once again, it's called Ayurveda for Strengthening Your Immune System and Balancing Mind, Body, and Soul. And this is going to be really an interesting seven-week journey with Mark uh, under his expert guidance where you will explore easy to implement practices and specific foods, lifestyle approaches, and plant medicines to improve every aspect of your health and boost your immune system. Uh, the seven-week course takes place on Mondays at 5 p.m. Pacific, starting Monday, April 20th. And as I mentioned earlier, if you can't join us live, that's fine. You won't miss out on the teachings because you will receive audio and video recordings, transcripts, and all course handouts on your course homepage. And also, I'd like to remind everyone that we offer a no-risk money-back guarantee on all of our courses, giving you a full two weeks until May 4th, in this case, to make sure that you absolutely love it. And as an added option, all participants are welcome to connect in a private Facebook community group so you can stay connected with one another. Also, everyone who registers receives the Ayurveda for Strengthening Your Immune System bonus collection. First, you receive an audio dialogue with Mark hosted by David Crow, entitled Managing Cancer with Ayurvedic Herbology. Next, you'll get a video dialogue with Mark and Kathy Cavell called Global Immune Enhancing Herbs. And you'll also receive a video teaching with Mark entitled Prana Shakti. And when you register by Midnight Pacific on Tuesday, April 14th, you will receive this extra gift, and that is a video teaching with Mark entitled Yoga Need and healing your body and mind. So before we get back into our viewer questions, Mark, let me ask you, what are you most looking forward to sharing in your upcoming course? That's such a great question. What am I looking forward to sharing the most? You know, what I'm looking forward to sharing the most isn't even about information. It's really about the heart. That's what I'm looking forward to sharing the most. Because if we can drop down into our hearts, we can begin to make the changes in our lives that are necessary. I'm really hoping that we're able to, through this seven week course, all join together in a heart centered group where we're able to begin to listen within. We say in Ayurveda that all the knowledge of the universe already exists within our hearts. All we need to do is access it. That's the great challenge. The most any teacher can do is hopefully help the student to enter into their own heart because there they will find the knowledge and the language that they need in order to understand it. That's my great goal is to lead you to that place. And from the heart, we will be able to explore the knowledge of, of Ojas. And Ojas is the essence behind the forces that stabilize your physiology, the physiology of your body and the physiology of your mind. It's what creates a healthy immune system and it's what allows you to resist stress. Now, that's a new word, but as we begin to explore it and we begin to drop down into our hearts, I believe that it will make a lot more sense to you. Ayurveda is common sense, but what really does common sense mean? It means knowledge that we've come to know within ourselves to be true. That knowledge is found in our heart. And that's really what I'm looking forward to sharing the most. All right, beautiful, thank you. Let's go ahead and get into some questions from people. They're asking about their conditions. And uh, let's take one. Um, there's a couple of people who are asking about healing seasonal allergies. And then we've got a question. I, I'm trying to find it here, but it was basically that she seems to be coming down with more and more allergies. And she's wondering if Ayurveda can help her to uh, figure out why she's becoming more allergic as time goes on and how to reverse that trend. Mm, great question. So many people suffer from allergies and allergies are not just um, a reaction to something in the environment. An allergy is a weakness within the immune system, a sensitivity within the immune system that causes the immune system to overreact 
to something in your environment, and it seems to be different for everybody. For one person, it's it's cedar pollen. For another person, it could be something in their food that they're eating, and they can get an allergy from their foods. Uh, there are so many different kinds of allergies, allergies to a fragrance that is in, in soap or in shampoo. There are allergies that affect your skin. There are allergies that affect your digestion. There are allergies that affect your eyes and your respiratory system. So there are so many different kinds of allergies. And when we treat allergies in Ayurveda, we have to treat it from multiple uh, perspectives, from many sides at one time. So the first side that I'll mention, because it's directly related to this course, is your level of ojas, or this factor that stabilizes the functioning of your physiology, which also means stabilizing the functioning of your immune system. So if your immune system is stable, then when you, when, when you are in contact with that allergen, you will not overreact. So our goal is to stabilize the immune response. So that's an important part. Ayurveda says that in order to stabilize the immune system and build this ojas, we have to have healthy digestion. So that brings us back to diet and the foods we eat. And it's not just the foods we eat, it's how we digest the food. You've heard the old adage, you are what you eat. I would prefer to say, you are what you digest. And so we have to, in Ayurveda, come to maximize the quality of our digestion so that we can extract out of our food that which is going to help us build the ojas in our bodies. So we've got to take the proper foods, we've got to take them the proper way, we have to digest them well. That, from an Ayurvedic perspective, is the root of the disturbance. So the immune system and the digestive system are very closely connected together. Then in addition to that, we have to take a look at the stresses in our mind because the stresses in our mind can also destroy the ojas or the factors that stabilize the immune response. And so we want to work on stress reduction and we want to work on our digestive system. And then we want to work directly on the immune system. So now we've got three different things to do, three different systems, digestive system, the mind, and the immune system. And now we have a fourth approach we have to take, and we do all of these in, an, in, in a complete Ayurvedic program. And the fourth approach is to address the tissue that is being affected by the allergy. So if that's the respiratory system, then we're going to target the respiratory system with specific medicines. Now we get really into the medicines. If it's the skin, we're going to work with the skin and topical uh, medicines that are going to specifically ease the discomfort and the suffering on the skin. Same thing in the digestive system or any other system of the body that might be affected by the allergy. So we've got a four-pronged approach that we're gonna wind up taking. Digestive system, the mind, the immune system, and then specifically targeting the tissues that are affected. And in doing that, we're gonna give your body the best chance in order to heal. And that's our goal, is to maximize the potential of the body to heal itself. Because really, ultimately, it is your body that is going to heal itself. We want to be able to support that process. You know, our bodies only become sick when we are are out of harmony and when we are, are compromised in some way. If we can move back into harmony, maximize our potential, our body will do what it is designed to do. And that is to heal. That's our goal. Okay, uh, so since you've talked about digestion uh, a lot here, let's take a question about that. Sylvia says, unfortunately, last week I had an unexpected gallbladder removal surgery, and I would like to know how this will influence my digestion from an Ayurvedic perspective. Yeah, thank you. That's a very good question. Uh, so many different levels from which we can explore that. So when you've had your gallbladder out, the gallbladder's role is to, is to store and then secrete bile. But that bile is actually made by your, your liver. And when your gallbladder has been removed, it gets rewired so that bile can move from your liver directly into your small intestine. So you get reorganized in that area of the surgery. 
it never works as well as you know, we evolved, which is to have a storage area for that bile, which is which is your gallbladder, that can secrete it as needed in the right doses into your small intestine. And because of that, the digestion of fat tends to be impaired. And when fat digestion is impaired, it can create some nutrient deficiencies. It can also create some digestive discomfort. Now that said, while I say it can, I also want to emphasize that it doesn't always. Our bodies are incredibly adaptable. They're incredibly adaptable. And so I absolutely hold open the possibility that your body will be able to adapt to that new structure that has been designed in your liver, gallbladder, small intestine uh, interface, and that your body may be able to do just fine without it. And you will be able to do that even better if you are able to moderate or modify your diet and your approach to food so that it is as harmonious as possible from an Ayurvedic perspective. Now you say from an Ayurvedic perspective, what is that going to do? Well, the gallbladder is an organ in Ayurveda that uh, affects digestion and it also affects a dosha in Ayurveda and that's the pitta dosha. And so uh, you could start to develop certain uh, uh, challenges with the pitta dosha and the pitta dosha is the dosha that is responsible for uh, the digestion of food and the preparation of that food to become nutrient that is then going to be used to build the tissues of the body. The good news is that you can certainly adapt to it and that the knowledge of Ayurveda can be used to help your adaption so that you don't develop digestive problems, so that you don't develop tissue development problems and your tissues are then going to be as strong as possible. So working closely with an Ayurvedic practitioner on a specific situation like that is definitely recommended. Uh, it's not something that I'd recommend you only doing by yourself. I mean, it all comes down to you. You have to implement that knowledge. But I think that having the guidance of an Ayurvedic practitioner, or Ayurvedic doctor, uh, as you go through your healing process would be really advantageous because there are many strategies that we utilize to uh, assure that your digestion is proper. And we want to try certain strategies and monitor you and see how they are working for you. And we may have to make changes as we go along. But we will get there. You will get there when you work with your practitioner. Hmm. Okay. That's really interesting because uh, the question came in while you were talking. Um, Paula says, I've been diagnosed with non-alcoholic fatty liver, my gallbladder was removed decades ago. I've tried many methodologies to improve this condition to no avail. And you've already sort of touched on this, but her follow-up question is, is there anything in the Ayurvedic system that can help? I'm assuming the answer is yes. Yeah, there is. And, and, and you know, I, I want to emphasize, when, especially when you say, and I assume the answer is, is yes, Ayurveda can help you to heal from every known condition when healing is possible. And I think that's really important to uh, qualify. The role of Ayurveda is to maximize the potential of the body to heal. And a fatty liver is one of those things that Ayurveda can help you with. And in a situation like that, diet is, of course, very essential. Digestion, how you're digesting your food, very essential. We have to look at that. I would suspect that there are digestive abnormalities as a result of that, not having the gallbladder and having the fatty liver. Fatty liver is going to interfere with the functions of the, uh, the liver, and the liver has so many different functions. So what kind of symptoms you're having will depend upon how your condition has progressed. You know, there are severe cases and there are, are less severe cases. And there are herbs that can be used in order to help to facilitate the functioning of your liver if it has become compromised. So our goal would be to take a look at your current situation. How are you digesting the food? What kinds of symptoms are you having as a result of the fatty liver, if, if any at all? Uh, sometimes it's just fatigue and sometimes it's much more than that. And so we will have to address the symptoms, but we also want to address the overall health of your liver. The good news is that that, that the herbs and the diet can really help with that a lot. 
And, and then we want to look at any other factors that might be present that could be creating inflammation in your liver because inflammation is often at the root of uh, this condition. And so uh, that's what we're gonna look at. And we would need to do more of an evaluation, more of a consultation in order to fully understand you as a unique individual. Because I wanna emphasize, not every patient with fatty liver is treated the same way, right? When you have a patient in the West and there is a disease condition, we, you tend to treat everybody the same way. And you're using a statistical model that says, well, if we follow this regimen, statistically, the most people will get well. But the most people will get well could be 65%. And that gets most people well, but the other 35% do not. So when we follow an individualized approach and we really understand what's happening with you, we're able to you know, maximize the potential of your body, which we believe will bring up the, the rate of healing to 90, 95%, maybe even 100% for conditions that are healable in patients that are able to follow the recommendations. And I say in patients that are able to follow the recommendations because ultimately it's not just about medicines we give you, it's also about your lifestyle and the behaviors that you take. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, I think it did. Thank you so much for that. Uh, looking at the clock here, we are out of time. This has been just a fascinating conversation. Um, I want to thank our viewers for being with us today and for all the questions that you've sent in because you guys help make these conversations so interesting. Once again, Ayurveda for strengthening your immune system and balancing mind, body, and soul starts Monday, April 20th. And again, you can visit AyurvedaForHealthCourse.com to learn more and to register. So Mark, before we cut you loose, do you have any final words for our viewers? Uh, I, I first have a final word for you. Thank you so much for uh, hosting this, this beautiful program. And thank you to the Shift Network for hosting uh, this course, which I believe very much is going to uh, help you to transform your health and your well-being physically, emotionally, and even taking it to that next level, to the level of, of consciousness. And I really look forward to spending time with each of you and having a certain intimacy that we're able to create with each other uh, as we uh, share this time together over what will be nearly two months with uh, seven Mondays. And, and I'm honored that you would consider spending that time with me, and I hope to make that time valuable for you and meaningful for you as you go through not just these seven weeks, but as you go through the rest of your life. Many blessings to all of you on this journey. Whether you participate in the course or not, I truly, I truly wish you the best on this journey. And if I'm ever able to provide any support for you, it would be my honor, my privilege. Thank you. All right, well, thank you again. Dr. Mark Halpern. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. And once again, I want to thank everyone who joined us. On behalf of all of us at the Shift Network, I wish you well and look forward to having you on this course or perhaps another one in the future. Have a great night, everyone. <music>